Right, welcome everybody to this afternoon's strategic planning. Uh, if you can put your phones on silent or vibrate, we'll get started. Membership of the committee, I believe it is as printed. Minutes of the previous meeting, can we agree a true record? Thank you. Item three, declarations of interest in lobbying. I'll start with Councillor Sokol. Uh, Mr. Chair, I only got an email last night from Andy Roshvi about this application and more, more top lane. It's just for information, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Nothing else. Yeah, I, exactly the same as uh, myself as well. I received the same email. Yes, I've received the same email as well. Um, yes, um, but, but I have also received, and I, I got the impression that we may all have done a communication from somebody in relation to the Chidswell site, um, which uh, uh, may have been a bit oblique, but, uh, but I certainly noted, I've made a note of that. I, I have not responded to it, I've just noted that um, the comments have been made. Same email, no action taken, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, with regard to all agenda items except item 11, I've nothing to report at all. Item 11, whilst I have no direct pecuniary interest or personal interest, I have had correspondence with various residents of my ward, and I think it is best all round that for that item... I withdraw from the committee with your permission and act instead in the capacity of ward councillor. Uh, I've had an email about that, but since I won't be sitting on the committee, it's, it doesn't need to be recorded here, I would suggest. Well, I've had an email, I've had an email from a local police officer supporting it. And I have had the very same email. I'm just going to think about this one for Chidswell. I can't recollect one at all. No. I'm just saying to be honest. Yeah, no, that's right, Andrew, yeah. Um, right, item four, admission of the public. <coughs> Meeting done in public. We're on YouTube and goodness knows what else. Item five, any public questions? Item six, any deputation petitions? Seven, planning application site visits. This morning we went to Chidswell, Leeds Road, Chidswell, and then we also went to Haybeck Lane, Chidswell, had a short tour into Party Leeds, then worked his way back to Uddersfield. So, first item, page nine. This is... Liz and she's doing, let's have a look, Fox Hill, Owler Lane, Burstall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Liz Chippendale. I'm the case officer for this application. The application... <laughs> The application relates to the proposed change of use on a, of an existing haulage yard to a breakers yard at Owler Lane, Burstall. The site in a, is an existing haulage distribution depot made up of a central portal framed building and the siting of a storage containers and HGV vehicles around the periphery. To the northeast of the site is a company specialising in clinical and hazardous waste. To the north is the M62, which is to set down a steep embankment. To the east is Oakwell Industrial Estate with open fields and scattered residential dwellings to the west. The application is brought to this committee as the site area is um, over 0.5 hectares, hectares, which is in accordance with the scheme of delegation. As you can see from the aerial photographs, the site is an existing industrial site which is located on the border of an established industrial area with the Oakwell Industrial Estate to the east and southeast. The site currently holds a large volume of storage containers around the site which are stacked up to three containers in height in most places. 
The proposed development will see the removal of all storage containers and HGV vehicles stored on the site. The existing building and access will remain. All containers will be removed from the site. End-of-life vehicles will be delivered to the site and broken down for parts. The spare parts would be stored on racks within the central building and the remaining car carcasses stored to the north and northwest of the site. The site is located within the green belt as allocated within the local plan. As the site is screened and has a clear boundary from the wider green belt setting, officers consider that there, there be no additional impact on the openness and character of the green belt above that of the existing use. The proposal is therefore considered to comply with policy LP60 of the local plan. The proposed use will enable greater reuse and recycling of waste materials in Kirklees in compliance with the aims of LP43 of the local plan, which looks to encourage and support the minimisation of waste product and support the reuse and re recovery of waste materials. The proposed use is considered by officers sunk to comply with LP44 and LP45 of the local plan, which relate to the creation of new waste management facilities and the safeguarding of existing waste management facilities. A condition is proposed to restrict the height of the storage of end-of-life vehicles to not exceed the existing height of storage containers. On this basis, the proposal is considered to be acceptable from visual amenity perspective in accordance with LP24. Based on the location of the site, the proposed use is not considered by officers to further impact the noise environment over and above the existing noise levels. However, conditions would be proposed to restrict the level of noise from the site and the hours of operation to mitigate any impact in accordance with local plan policy LP24. The proposed use will retain the existing access with fewer vehicle movements to and from the site from HGVs. Whilst the amount of car movements may increase slightly, the proposal is considered to be acceptable from a highways and efficiency perspective in line with the aims of local plan policy LP21. In conclusion, the proposed change of use is considered by officers to be acceptable. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got one speaker who's joining us virtually, Andrew Barlow. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate, really, on, um, on, on Liz's comments, for me, the term <laughs> breaker's yard can quite easily uh, bring to mind those old fashioned yards with massive car crushing machine surrounded with old rusty cars stacked high and leaking fluids into ground <clears throat> and being guarded at night by a large pack of angry dogs all behind a perimeter fence topped with razor wire well that's not uh, that's not what's going to happen here um these days however thanks to you know new health and safety standards legislation to prevent contamination the breaker operations are quite different you know nowadays the cars that are dismantled uh, the dismantling of cars will take place mainly inside the lower of the two buildings. Uh, they'll be manually stripped to salvage individual components which are cleaned as necessary, categorised, indexed and stored in the large of the buildings. Ultimately, they'll be dispatched, usually through a courier system uh, as motor spares. The fluids, fluids uh, whether fuel, oil or brake fluid, they're drained from the broken vehicles and stored separately and collected by a specialist company. So again, no ground contamination there. So just to sum up as a direct comparison, the existing use uh, to the proposed use of the site, the size of vehicles coming to and from the application site are to be smaller. The number of trips to and from the site is to be fewer. The noise emissions from the site and surrounding area is therefore to be reduced. The air quality will improve. Thank you. Right, thank you, Andrew. Right. Members, it's over to you. Councillor Davis. Yep, um, certainly there doesn't appear to me to be anything um, that would concern myself uh, with regards to this application. Um, I think uh, it's, it's fairly well laid out through the presentation from the officer and the contribution we just, just heard. I think in particular the, the recycling aspect of this done in a in a safe and controlled way, uh, which doesn't you know, cause harm uh, to, to residents or to the local environment. So um, from my perspective, I'd certainly be very happy to, um, to move recommendation. Yeah, a second. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, in a very interesting location, this site. Um, to say it's in Greenbelt is, is perhaps, um, well, that's 
well, I note, note that the M62 is in Greenbelt as well, but um, um, <coughs> right next to the M62 and right next to the um, retail and industrial estate, but not connected with it. Um, the, only, the only thing that I'm, I'm sort of a bit concerned about is that if the number of vehicle movements from this site um, got to beyond a certain level, then uh, is Fieldhead Lane, which is the road that this comes out onto, is that is that up to up to taking that sort of level of um, uh, of use? Um, alternatively, and there, at the moment there is no connection with Holdening Way, uh, which is in in the um, Burstall Retail Park, um, and connecting it up might be a little bit difficult. I don't know, but that that just occurs to me as, an, as another solution, which would then bring the traffic out onto the A62 um, and uh, with all the other stuff from there. I, 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 I'd just like some reassurance that, that, that um, the amount of traffic coming out of this site, uh, it, that Owler Lane and Fieldhead Lane can cope with it. Um, just as an aside, Field Lane going going north could probably cope with it, but going south into the middle of Burstall is not such a good idea. Um, but um, uh, I, I just like, I mean, I'm, I'm, on the whole, I'm supporting that, but I just like clarification on those points. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just in terms of the uh, traffic generation numbers, the existing use is estimated to generate about 40 two-way trips during the day. Um, of that, that would be about 12 HGV movements and 28 light vehicle movements, um, whereas the proposed use would reduce that to about 26 two-way movements over the day. So th there's a reduction in traffic with this, uh, this, this development. Thanks, Adam. Just if, if the use expands from that, would they have to come back to seek further permission uh, or, or what? Uh, well, I wouldn't expect that, that, that it, could, it would increase above the, the existing use. So even if they increase the number of cars that they can uh, throughput the site by perhaps three or four fold, it would still be less than it, its current use. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a few questions on the existing business. So uh, I assume that the hazardous waste, uh, any licences they've got with, that goes along with that will be um, extinguished because they're moving on into another business. And also I'm curious to know as far as storage, um, I know that they keep asbestos and other toxic materials up there, what, what's happening with all the toxic materials. And the other is that even though HGV um, uh, traffic decreases, I think it says somewhere in the paperwork that the um, domestic vehicle use will increase as far as customers going to and from. And therefore, if that is the case, are they still going to use Owler Lane as uh, ingress and egress, as it's quite a narrow lane, uh, it's used as a um, public walkway, and it also is quite close to a school. I'm not sure Joseph Priestley would appreciate either, that's where he was born, and seeing as he discovered oxygen, I'm not sure that the uh, toxic... I'm just joking, sorry. Um, so th those are the things that I, I need to know. Hazardous waste, storage and licence, does it go, does it stay? And um, the car increase, um, is it going to still be used in our lane? Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, Chair. In, in regards to the clinical and hazardous waste, that is um, a business which it operates next to the site, so it's not within this red line boundary. Um, so we don't have any further information on, on that site. Um, in terms of the... Um, was it the access? Do you want to... Was it? 
through you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just in terms of the light vehicle movements, the light vehicle movements would be slight, a slight increase, but it, it is still similar to its existing use. So the existing use is estimated to generate about 28 light vehicle movements over the day, um, whereas the proposed oh, it would actually be slightly lower, actually, at 26 over the day, um, based on the estimates of the existing staff numbers. So it, it's similar in terms of light vehicle movements but lower in terms of HGVs. Any more questions? I think one thing is with this area, as I passed it yesterday, it's getting more and more industrialised up there. When you come out of our lane and you go up onto bypass at the top, the firms appearing, and at one time I think it just used to be Wilkinson's potato farm that were at top but uh, at least another business going in um, it has been moved and it has been seconded if there's no more comments or questions so we'll go to a vote and it has been moved by councillor davis seconded by councillor sokol okay. yeah um right so councillor sokol councillor davis four Councillor Patterson? Four. Councillor Pinnock? Four. Uh, Councillor Thompson? Four. Councillor Armour? Four. Councillor Hall? Four. Okay, that's unanimous. So uh, application has been approved. Right. Right, next item. Uh, when I get to the page. Right, item 11, page 21, Moore Top Lane, Uddersfield, Callum. Thank you, Chair. Callum Harrison, Development Management. This application relates to the change of use of land to private dog walking with associated works at land adjacent to Moore Top Lane, Flockton. The application site is a field to the northeast side of Moortop Lane. The last use for the field was of an agricultural use. The field is bound by fencing and hedges on all four sides and covers an area of 0.74 hectares. The field benefits from vehicular access from Moortop Lane to the, west, to the southwestern side of the site, with an existing hard standing area beyond it. The proposed development would see two pens formed, each killed by fencing for private use of the customer. Each pen would include activities and enrichment for the dogs. The applicant proposes a maximum of 10 dogs to use the site in total at any one time. Parking for each pen would be provided on the existing hard standing area. This would be resurfaced with crushed stone. The site will provide four vehicle parking spaces. This is, two, this is to allow two vehicles per booking per pen and to facilitate the swap over time when the next customer waits, uh, when the next customer arrives for the current user to vacate the premises. The existing access gate from Moortop Lane would be widened to a width of five metres and set back six metres from the highway. Uh, the access would then be tarmacked adjacent to Moortop Lane. Uh, the agent has proposed operating hours of 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. April to September inclusively and 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. October to March inclusively. For the benefit of members now on the screen is um, a picture of the site taken from the existing access. Um, that is a hard standing area over the lifetime of development. It has been laid, taken up and so forth, but that is the extent of the current hard standing area with the field all the way beyond it. Uh, the aerial plan on screen shows the site in the context of the wider area of Flockton. The wider site is rural and allocated as Greenbelt. The proposal would provide a facility for outdoor recreation and is supported by local plan policy LP56. It would also utilise an existing access and hard standing area. This limited ancillary development is considered reasonable and require, is considered reasonably required and also accords with local plan policy LP56. There are sporadic threads of, of residential development in the surrounding area. The closest dwelling to the application site is 
situated 70 metres away to the northwest. Dwellings can also be found 85 metres away to the south and 135 metres away to the northwest. Given these vast separation distances to residential development, officers consider the ability for the proposed dog exercise use um, would not likely materially harm the residential amenity of nearby dwellings and its chance of harm is very limited. Nevertheless, officers are still seeking to impose conditions to the, restrict the hours of operation as proposed and to prevent the erection of artificial lighting to prevent any undue harm to the closest dwellings. Subject to these conditions, officers consider the development is acceptable on residential amenity grounds. The site is served from an existing access on Moortop Lane, which can be seen on screen now in that picture on the top left side. The hard standing area is considered suitable in size to allow a sufficient number of vehicles to be parked off street and allow for manoeuvring so vehicles can enter and exit the site in a forward gear. Safe visibility space can also be provided subject to the cutting back, to, cutting back of further hedgerows which will be conditioned appropriately. Subject to conditions relating to the visibility displays to be provided, works to the access and the site operating via a booking system, officers and KC Highways Development Management consider that the scheme would not detriment the safety of the wider highway network, thus according with local plan policies and the MPPF. For the reasons set out above and subject to the full conditions listed in section 12 of the committee report, officers consider that the application represents sustainable development in the Greenbelt and therefore recommend approval in line with the Kirklees local plan, the MPPF and all relevant supplementary planning documents. Finally, officers would just note to add one late representation was received in support of the application as all members received um, and this was circulated by the agent yesterday via email. Thank you, Chair. Right, thanks, Colin. Right, we've got three speakers. One of them is Councillor Bill Armour. Uh, Bill, you've got five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I want to make clear, I have no personal interest in this matter, but as Ward Councillor, I'm responding to concerns raised by a number of local residents. I note that at paragraph 7.2 of the officer report, I am recorded as having raised as far back as last April uh, concerns with the officer regarding on and off site parking, road safety relating to access egress of vehicles, and what I see as potentially harmful effects on the green belt. I note that I have not raised concerns about the nature of the proposed development per se, and I have no objections in principle. I'm aware that para 1010 of the report calls for a condition designed to prevent on street parking and I request that such a condition is imposed and, if necessary, enforced, should approval be granted. I also note that paragraph 10.2 of the report records that there is already a sufficient area of hard standing on site to accommodate parking and urge that, should approval be granted, it is conditioned that this area is not to be extended in order to protect the green belt. From the outset, my major concern has been for highway safety on Moor Top Lane and in particular with regard to vehicles entering and leaving the site. I note proposed conditions five and six, and urge that these be incorporated with any approval which may be granted. I have recently had communications from a local resident who claims that he owns part of the hedgerow, and at least one of the hawthorn bushes, mentioned in paragraph 1011. This resident has indicated to me that the applicant has already cut back part of the hedgerow owned by him without permission, allegedly in order to obtain the required visibility display, and has stated that he, that is the resident, will not grant future permission for such work. That is not of itself a material planning concern, and I have advised my resident to contact a solicitor should he wish to do so. What is a material planning concern is a requirement to obtain and maintain the required visibility display, as detailed in paragraph 1011 of the report and proposed conditions 5 and 6. For the record, I note here that even were planning permission to be granted, this would not of itself authorise any work to third party property or land. That being the case, I have grave and I think reasonable doubts that the applicant could obtain, and most importantly maintain, the stipulated visibility display. In the terms of paragraph 1011, any such failure would lead to an unacceptable compromise 
of road safety for users of Moor Top Lane. The report is quite clear on that. I strongly urge members to give the greatest possible weight to road safety here. Moor Top Lane is a straight stretch of relatively narrow country lane, subject to a 60 mile per hour speed limit. It is vital that we do not compromise the safety of visitors to the proposed facility and that we do everything reasonable to maintain a safe environment for motorists using water lane. To those ends, I request that should approval be granted, it is conditioned that the applicant is able to demonstrate that, either by land ownership or contractual arrangements, <coughs> the requisite visibility displays can be obtained and maintained throughout the life of the facility. And that documentary proof of this is furnished to this authority before the commencement and use of the facility. Alternatively, I request that a decision on this application be deferred until such time as the applicant is able to produce suitable evidence to this committee of the, of the ability to meet and maintain the visibility display requirements. I think that's very, very important, members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next is Andy Rushby. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, members. My name is Shawnee Macken, and I'm the applicant. Just over a year ago, I found some land left to wreck and ruin and bought it to exercise our two rescue dogs. The transformation from where we began a year ago is unrecognisable. Ex I experienced the daily struggle of a damaged rescue dog. My Labrador is reactive on lead. He is terrified of most things in the outdoor world, which makes him difficult to walk. Like many rescue dogs, this can hinder them getting homes. We have a generation of poorly socialised lockdown puppies and the number of dogs in social spaces has rocketed. Many of these dogs have poor social skills. Ultimately, if people can't control and walk their dogs, many more will end up in rescue. The secured fields are inclusive. They provide security and safety, whether it be the disabled, the elderly bad on their feet, the worried and nervous dogs and donors, or the dog walker who can't keep eyes everywhere. I'd love to provide my field to our community. I'm hoping that my field can be somewhere for people to walk their dogs in a safe and secure environment, and that is all. Happy Meadows will help reduce dog fouling in public spaces, the amount of people walking their dogs on unsafe roads, and the amount of dogs worrying sheep in the local area. I love the countryside, environment, and everything that comes with it, and so wish to keep my field rural and encourage the natural habitat by including woodland copses in unused space. I have made contact with Kirkley's Trade Waste for the collection of dog waste and they will deliver me a bin within two weeks of application. I also have contacted Kirkley's White Rose Forestry and have taken their advice on how to create a fuller boundary to mitigate any noise and create wildlife corridors. I have taken on board the issues raised by highways and I have worked with them to agree to their recommendations. I am happy to abide by all of the conditions suggested by the case officer and hope that you will be able to approve this application. Thank you, members. Next, Andy Rushby. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, commend your case officer for what I thought was a thorough and well-balanced assessment of the, uh, of the application. If I could address the matter raised by Councillor Armour firstly, in terms of the ownership of, of the hedgerow, it's my understanding that that element, that part of the hedgerow, which may or may not be in the ownership of a third party, is not required in terms of maintenance to provide the visibility display. If you look at the site from Motop Lane, it's the hedgerow to the right-hand side of the access that needs to be cut back to create the visibility display. The hedgerow on the left-hand side doesn't need that work. Uh, the applicant has worked closely with uh, officers to overcome areas of concern by restricting um, operating hours and the maximum number of dogs on site at any one time. I'd just like to clarify as well, the, in terms of the number of dogs, whilst uh, um, a point was made about 10 dogs, that would be five per area. So there are two areas within the site, a maximum of five dogs per area at any one time. 
as we've already discussed, the, the applicant has already agreed to, uh, to uh, undertake access improvements in it with regard to highway safety and to improve sight lines onto Moor Top Lane. The um, transport assessment that was submitted with the application shows that the average speeds of traffic on Moor Top Lane are less than 60 miles an hour. And I think I understand that uh, your officers in highway development management are happy with the, uh, the information that's being provided. All these matters can be controlled by the proposed conditions that are set out by your officer in the report. So I therefore hope that you'll be able to agree with the recommendation of your officers and the proposed conditions and to approve the application. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Andy. Members, it's over to you, Councillor Sokol. Thank you, Chair. I just want to ask uh, Officer uh, yeah, the booking time. Suppose first booking time is finished, yeah. Then second one start. Is there any gap between two booking? I believe if we have some time, at least half an hour between two booking or three booking, yeah, each. So the ground, the field will be clear by the first book, first dog owners, then the second one come. I'm not sure, it didn't say on this report any, any gap between booking. I think it would be better to reduce the any congestion, traffic congestion or others, set the booking time would be better. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm fully in support of uh, um, this, this uh, application and I'm, I'm grateful for the applicant and everything that uh, she's trying to do there. Um, I mean, some of us perhaps just used to let our dogs out onto the street and do whatever anywhere, but that isn't the case these days. Um, and I think this, this, <laughs> this sort of facility is becoming more and more popular um, and recognised as needed. I mean, as per uh, the, what the um, um, submission that we've got from the police officer actually states, as well as the applicant herself. Um, I'm sure a maximum of 10 dogs um, is more than manageable, um, and if they're, they're, that's only in two vehicles, then I, I think that's absolutely fine. I think an awful lot of thought's been gone, gone into this, including the, the visibility in terms of highways, so um, I'm quite happy to move it. Thank you, Chair. Well, I think off the top of my head, this is either the third or the fourth application that we've done here. Um, Councillor Pinnock. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I'm certainly, in general, in support of this. Um, there's just one question I, I, I must ask, and that's to do with the hours of operation. I, I note that the hours during the winter, um, and this is defined as um, October to March, um, allow use up to seven o'clock, by which time it will have been dark for two hours. Um, and um, I'd just like to clarify whether, whether use of the facility is, is allowed in those two hours or um, are they doing other things? Um, I'm, I, I mean, I think members will un get my drift, and that is that if you want to do um, use the facilities during those hours, you might need some lights. And I know that's specifically ruled out, but I'd just like to to work out what what is the relationship between the hours of hours of use, um, the, the summer hours. That's not a problem, but um, but there will be a certain period of the winter uh, up to two hours of darkness uh, while the place is still open. Callum. Through you, Chair. We'll just start with Councillor Sokol's question about the booking system and how we operate. So, yeah, it, it is up to 10 dogs at a time, but that's across two bookings only. Um, there's four parking spaces provided, so you would have those two vehicles 
um, using two of the spaces, then there will be two spaces vacant for the next booking to arrive. So there wouldn't be 10 vehicles at any one time. Um, that can be, con number of vehicles and so forth can be conditioned as, as we've set out in there. So it wouldn't be that one dog is with each vehicle and would have a backlog or, or anything like that. Um, and then going to Councillor Pinnett's question about those hours of operation. Um, yeah, we, we appreciate it. it would be dark, especially in the winter months, through some of those hours of operation. And we are conditioned no artificial lighting, but that doesn't necessarily mean things like personal level lighting, so torches and so forth can't be used. So it would be up to the people and the customers and the owner whether they think it is safe to operate at that time, more outside of our remit. Um, but in terms of those hours focusing purely on amenity, uh, we don't deal with those conditions that those hours would cause any harm for amenity. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Colin. Paul. Yep, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, like Carl Patson, I'd like to mention, um, it's certainly good to hear from the applicant um, you know, what they're trying to achieve here. Uh, great to hear the passion uh, and, and the care that obviously uh, she has in terms of well -being, the well-being of dogs. And from uh, the basis of uh, living in the village which is plagued by dog uh, mess, then uh, you know, certainly these sorts of facilities are absolutely um, uh, welcomed. Um, I, th I think the thing I wanted to ask, just to clarify it completely, because there's been, you know, um, Councillor Arm has raised this, and there's been some comment, is around the sight lines and the visibility. And could we, really, could we just run through that uh, from the officers so that we've got an absolute clear picture on that? Thank you. Right, Adam. Uh, yeah, through you, Chair. Um, yeah, the visibility displays. We, we, we got the applicant to undertake a, a speed survey, a week-long speed survey along the road to, and to ascertain the uh, vehicle speeds. Um, they, they came out at 48.5 miles an hour. So based on that, uh, we've determined that visibility displays of about 125 metres in each direction are required. Now, those are achievable to the north-west in front of the hedge, which is not along the site boundary, um, but to the southeast, um, they require significant cutting back of the hedge, which is, has now been done. So the visibility displays can, can now be achieved and be maintained by uh, yeah, trimming the hedge along the site frontage. Adam. If I could just add, Chair, yeah, um, we've, we've put a plan up now of the visibility display of the entrance that Adam was just referring to. Apologies about that, we didn't, we didn't really time it or time it correctly, but you what, sorry? Right. But Adam can explain that, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, through you, Chair. Um, so it's the visibility display there on the, on the south uh, east side that, that needs cutting back. That's actually an older version of the drawing that had um, uh, uh, visibility displays pre the, um, the radar survey. There is an updated drawing actually to that, um, which shows that the display to the north that's required is 127 metres, and, and that, that would sit in front of a hedge rather than need it to be, uh, to be trimmed. Uh, thanks very much. I think, Chair, on that basis, I, I'm, I'm happy to second uh, the proposal. Right. Just ask a question about these edges. <clears throat> We've got some edges, and we can only cut them in certain parts of the year. Is that also the case with these edges? You can only cut them, I think it's after the end of September, because birds are nesting, so therefore you can't go within five miles of them because you might disturb nesting birds. Do we know if that's right? Um, yeah, through you, Chair. Um, within the details of the scheme to keep the visi visibility display clear, we would consult our college officer in terms of time of the year, make sure there's no future damage. So, or in terms of all that future maintenance schedule, that would all be tied into there under that condition. Thank you. Right. So we'll go to a vote. Okay. All right, so this is a vote for <coughs> approval as outlined in the submitted report. Um, Councillor Sokol? For. Councillor Davis? For. Councillor Patterson? For. Councillor Pinnock? For. Councillor Thompson? For. Councillor Hall? For. It's actually unanimous, so the application's been approved. Right, next.
Yes, please, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Victor Grayson, Development Management Master Planner in the Majors and Minerals team. Items 12 and 13 are position statements relating to two outline applications for mixed-use development at the MXS7 allocated site at Chidswell. Members, can I refer you to paragraph 1.3 of both position statements regarding the purpose of the position statements? And please note the advice there that today's discussion would not predetermine the applications. Members will recall seeing a position statement relating to this development at pre-application stage in July 2019 and again at application stage in November 2020. The two position statements before members today provide updates on the planning policy and guidance landscape that has emerged since members last considered these applications on recent changes to the site's context and recent representations and consultee responses. Updates are also provided regarding the issues the applicant team, officers and consultees have been working on in recent months, including in relation to highway matters and Section 106 obligations. There is also commentary in the position statements regarding sustainability, biodiversity, ancient woodlands and impacts on heritage assets. This presentation will similarly focus on those matters and updates. I won't provide an assessment of all the planning issues relevant to these applications today. I will, however, provide a reminder of the locations of the sites and their attributes, constraints and contexts. As mentioned, two outline applications are currently before the Council, one relating to the larger part of the site allocation, where residential development of up to 1,354 dwellings, employment development of up to 35 hectares, plus a new primary school and a local centre are proposed. At the other smaller site, referred to as the Haybeck Lane site, a residential development of up to 181 dwellings is proposed. The site is greenfield land, having been released from the Greenbelt when the local plan was adopted in 2019. And the photos on the right here show, show some of the views into the site seen by members this morning. This slide shows the MXS7 site allocation in red. Members will note that the allocation meets the Kirklees Wakefield Borough boundary. Housing allocations are shown in orange to the west. To the right are map extracts showing public rights away crossing the application sites, as well as watercourses and biodiversity designations. Zooming out, this slide illustrates the site in relation to Junction 28 of the M62, that's the Tingley Interchange, and the Capital Park development site to the north. They were both visited by members this morning. Also annotated here is Junction 40 of the M1, that's the Flush Dyke interchange. This slide and the position statements provide an update on how the site's context has changed since members last considered these applications, and members saw some of these changes on site this morning. Of particular note, the Barrett Homes Owl Lane development is underway, as are developments at sites at Suttill, Challenge Way and the Shawcross Junction. The Gawthorpe Water Tower is now a Grade 2 listed building and the Huntsman Inn has closed, that's the Huntsman Inn that was on Chiswell Lane, that's closed and it has planning permission for two new dwellings within its grounds. This, site, this slide illustrates the extent of further site investigation work carried out by the applicant team at the end of last year. The findings of these investigations have informed the viability assessment which I'll, which I'll come to shortly. Local residents have also been gathering information. On the right here are extracts from an online facility where local residents have uploaded useful information regarding wildlife sightings in and around the application sites. So to provide a reminder to members of what the applicant has submitted, these, these two applications are for outline planning permission with access being the only matter not reserved. Therefore, limited detail has been submitted regarding actual proposals on the ground, and the applicant has submitted a suite of parameter plans. If outline planning permission is granted, these would define the parameters of any development at this site, and members will be aware that those details would be fleshed out at reserve matter stage if outline permission is granted. So here we see the developable areas proposed by the applicant, as well as land uses and the proposed points of access. 
The larger site would have four vehic vehicular access points, two on Leeds Road, two on Chiswell Lane, while the smaller site would have a single vehicular access point off Haybeck Lane. Pedestrian and cycle connections are also proposed. And then these parameter plans show the applicant's proposals for blue and green infrastructure, i.e. where they propose key drainage infrastructure and new planting and habitats. The applicant has stated that an on-site biodiversity net gain can be achieved. Moving on to the key issues that have been worked on over the last two years, this slide illustrates the junction mitigation schemes drawn up by the applicant team for junction 28 of the M62 and junction 40 of the M1. These have been devised in consultation with officers from Kirklees, Leeds and Wakefield councils, as well as national highways, and in the case of Junction 28, the developers of the Capital Park site, as that major development may also add significant vehicular movements to that junction. All those parties are comfortable with the designs of the junction mitigation schemes, subject to details being ironed out. As regards who delivers these mitigation works and when, the two developers have agreed how to split the responsibility and Leeds City Council are currently working out their mechanism for securing the work, which would in turn have a bearing on how the applicant for the Chiswell site would meet their responsibility. Of note, the Capital Park scheme is subject to a resolution to grant planning permission. That was, that was the re resolution of the uh, of Leeds City Council City Plans Panel. There are also ongoing discussions regarding monitoring of traffic levels at these two motorway junctions. The applicant is of the view that the predicted traffic levels may not in fact materialise and therefore rather than implementing these works at an early stage, the applicant proposes to monitor impacts for a period to enable the various authorities to ascertain whether the schemes or parts thereof are in fact needed. On the right of this slide we also see the Shawcross Junction Improvement Scheme which is being progressed by the Council as part of the M2D2L project. Contributions toward that, towards that scheme have already been secured from other nearby developers and the Chiswell applicant would, be also, would also be expected to contribute. Finally, regarding junctions, detailed design work and assessment is ongoing regarding the Haybeck Lane, Leeds Road, Sutil Lane Junction, the Dewsbury Road, Rain, Rain Road, Thike Road Junction further to the north within the uh, borough of the city of Leeds, and the proposed development entrances on Chiswell Lane, Leeds Road and Haybeck Lane. Regarding public transport, discussions have taken place with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and Arriva, who are the main operator in the area, regarding bus route provision and diversions, and funding for this would need to be included in any Section 106 agreement should outline permission be granted. This is, just to remind members, this is the uh, indicative master plan submitted by the applicant. This shows how a mixed use development may be laid out within the larger site, complying of course with the parameters set out in the plan shown earlier. This plan however is indicative and if outline permission is granted, this plan would not be among the approved drawings. Members should be able to make out the orange area which illustrates where the two form entry primary school would be located. And I'd like to stay on that issue members, that, that issue of the provision of a primary school for a minute at least because there's quite a lot to say on that on that matter and it has been the subject of extensive discussions recently with the applicant team. Members will be aware that a new primary school is a requirement of the site allocation. The applicant has allowed for this in their plans and in their recent viability assessment work however there has been a lot of discussion recently regarding when and how that school and or other primary school provision would be delivered in connection with the proposed development. Members if you refer to the housing delivery figures set out at paragraph 8.2 of the position statement. They'll be of use to you. These give a rough idea of how the dwellings would be delivered at this site. They are indicative though. And they therefore give a rough, give, provide a rough idea of how the local population would grow and how the numbers of primary school aged children would grow locally. This is useful information that colleagues in education at the council have used to ascertain when the primary school would be needed and as it says in the position statement it's reckoned that the new school would need to come online around the 300 unit point so the year 2029 roughly but these figures are indicative and are subject to change also there are several other variables of relevance here including population trends so members will appreciate that families can move in and out of the neighborhood it's not known how popular the development will prove to be with families. Birth rates can change. 
We don't yet know the full impacts of lockdowns and the cost of living crisis, etc. There's also the issue of parental choice regarding schools and, of course, build-out rates of this development and other developments could accelerate or they could slow down. All of this means it's very difficult to precisely predict when and what is needed in relation to primary school provision in connection with the development of this size. Another consideration regarding the timing of the new primary school relates to the fact that it would introduce a large number of additional school places, around 420, that if introduced before they were actually needed, would saturate the area with over-provision and may risk diverting children and undermining, undermining existing local schools as a new school would uh, be open to children from outside the development and it's likely to prove, prove attractive to parents. That said, there would of course be growing demand for additional school places prior to the point where the new school is needed. All these considerations indicate that any new primary school provision secured in connection with the proposed development at this site needs to be firstly flexible to allow for the various unknowns that may affect primary school needs. It needs to be carefully timed to avoid undermining existing schools. And thirdly, it needs to include provision for possibly temporary expansion of existing local schools for the period up to the point where the new school is needed. A couple of other points to note regarding primary school provision. Firstly, the cost of a new primary school would be significant, and all the although the applicant has said that the, that the proposed development is viable and can afford all of the required Section 106 obligations, they initially advised that the cost of the school would mean it couldn't be provided until some point after the 300 unit point had been reached, possibly at the 750 unit point. The applicant, however, is expected to present some new information on that point today. Uh, and the applicant's team have continued to explore ways in which the school could be provided at the right time, along with contributions to fund expansion of local schools in the interim period. It's also important to note that although alternatives to on-site provision have been considered, on-site provision is a site allocation requirement, and the applicant does want to provide a new school on-site for placemaking reasons. And finally, it should be noted that the new school would be of public benefit, as it would not be exclusively used by residents of the development, <clears throat> and the surrounding local residents could also use it. So moving on from primary school provision, regarding other Section 106 obligations, the applicant has confirmed that these can be provided and, crucially, can be provided when they are needed. And lastly, the applicant has confirmed that each phase of the development's residential element would include a policy-compliant 20% affordable housing provision. Returning to the slides, here we see the indicative layout of the smaller site. Members would note, will note that it would have a single vehicular access from Haybeck Lane, which we saw the location of today, this morning. This slide also shows the adjacent ancient woodland at Dunwood, regarding which there is commentary in the position statement where it's suggested that continued but controlled public access should be provided. Members can also see here the 20 metre wide gap between the development and the woodland, which would be a planted buffer. This slide illustrates character areas suggested by the applicant for the larger part of the development and shows the retained public rights of way running through the site, as well as the other ancient woodland, Bogloich Wood. And then finally, the last slide, here we see a phasing plan which remains indicative, although in recent discussions the applicant has suggested that the up to 181 units of the Haybeck Lane site and the employment element, for which there is currently strong demand, would be built early on in the programme. Members will note from the position statements that further information regarding biodiversity is to be submitted by the applicant, that an assessment relating to the now listed Gawthorpe Water Tower has found impacts on that heritage asset to be minimal, and that the site is regarded as a sustainable location for mixed-use development. A way forward is set out in the position statements, noting that a second round of public consultation is proposed before the applica applications are brought back to committee for determination. To conclude, the position statements do not include recommendations for determination and are presented to the committee for information and comment. Thank you. Right, thanks, Victor. We've now got um, a 15-minute presentation by the applicants. We've got Stephen Evans, Christian Colbeck and Nolan Tucker. And it's over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, members. Um, my name is Nolan Tucker. I'm representing the Church Commissioners today. 
Um, we've got a, a, short, a short presentation, um, firstly providing in just a general sort of overview, and I think you've probably heard um, a fair bit of information there already from the case officer about the work that we've been doing since we submitted the planning application. But we then like to focus in a bit more detail around some of the discussions on transport matters, and my colleague Stephen Evans um, will provide that information. And, and then also touching upon some of the points that the case officer raised around the Section 106 conversations, um, and in particular, um, the matter that was raised around primary school provision, and Christian Colbeck from Savills um, has been undertaking some work in relation to that. Um, the reason why we've been undertaking um, more work and actually work beyond that required for a planning application is that we want to gain a really good understanding of the site, of the constraints, um, of the inf infrastructure needs of the development. Um, it's work that could be undertaken subsequent to the planning applications, but clearly it's crucial to, to understand how a site of this sort of scale can be delivered. Um, and, and delivered over, over phases, as you've seen. Um, so we've undertaken a, a comprehensive geotechnical assessment. Um, so we've, we've, that's involved a large number of boreholes across the site. So we have a good understanding um, of some of the, the below ground constraints. As you saw on the plan that was displayed, we've also undertaken a comprehensive archaeological survey, which we did in consultation with the West Yorkshire Archaeological Advisory Service. Um, and we've also prepared a whole range of other information, including technical drawings on the Spine Road, um, updated vehicular access drawings, um, established more information around the utility requirements of the scheme, um, undertaken a cut and fill analysis, which can obviously then inform um, some of the work that we'll be, do be doing around the development platforms. Um, as you've heard, we've been spending um, a lot of our time with National Highways, and the Highways Authority that leads Kirklees, obviously, and Wakefield. Um, to come to an agreement over the mitigation required on the local junctions, but also on the key motorway junctions, which Steve Evans will come on to explain a bit shortly. Um, all of that information that we've, we've prepared has then gone into a cost assessment that's been undertaken by um, Bentley Project Management. Um, and that, that information has then been taken forward by, by Savills and Christian's team um, to prepare a development appraisal. Um, and give us um, some clarity, really, around how we can deliver the scheme and when the different Section 106 requirements um, can be delivered. And we'll come on to more detail on that shortly. Um, as you probably heard as well, there are actually very few technical planning matters left to be addressed. Um, we will be updating very slightly some of our access drawings and be submitting those shortly. Um, we will also be undertaking um, a further ecological walkover survey. It's obviously been some time since we submitted the planning application. Um, and as you've heard, I think um, there's been some local information that's gathered. So we're keen for, for an ecologist to go out and, and do a, walk, a further walkover survey. Um, we'll also then be coming back to um, officers and yourselves as well to confirm how we will mitigate um, particularly um, the impact on farmland birds um, and also provide a, an updated biodiversity net gain assessment. And that's to reflect the, the change in, in matrix um, the change in the matrix requirement that has now come in by government since we submitted the application. Um, following that, of course, we'll, we'll then um, focus our discussions with officers around planning conditions um, and hopefully take on board um, any comments and, um, that we receive today around Section 106 matters so we can return back to, to committee, hopefully, in the near future. Um, but if I can stop there and just pass on to my colleague, um, Stephen Evans, who will focus on transport. Good afternoon, Chair and Members. Um, my name is Steve Evans from Pell Frischman. We are the Transport and Highways Consultants acting on behalf of the Church Commissioners um, in connection with this site. Um, just to provide you all with a very brief um, rundown of the technical work that's been completed since the planning application was submitted, um, including um, details relating to some of the more recent discussions um, between ourselves and offices at Kirklees as well as National Highways and Highways Offices at Leeds and Wakefield. Um, each of the two planning applications was um, supported by a thorough and detailed transport assessment and framework travel plan. Um, that transport assessment assessed both individually and cumulatively um, the traffic impacts of the proposed development across the site, um, and it assessed the traffic impacts um, in a future year um, at the end of the uh, local plan period. So that included a cumulative assessment of other committed developments expected to come forward in the area between now and the end of the local plan. And it also included um, predicted levels of background traffic growth um, based on predictions um, produced by the Department for Transport uh, pre-COVID. Um, all of those um, 
inputs were agreed with officers at Kirklees as well as National Highways. Uh, the transport assessment um, also assumed a robust traffic generation for the site. Um, again, that was agreed with officers at both Kirklees and National Highways. Um, that didn't allow for any modal shift as a result of the travel plan. However, we do expect modal shift onto walking, cycling and public transport modes to occur. Uh, and therefore, the trip rates that have been used in the assessment are considered um, by officers as well as ourselves to be um, robust. The transport assessment has assessed the proposed five site access junctions, um, as can be seen um, on this plan that's up on the screen, uh, Haybeck Lane, two access junctions on Leeds Road, and an access junction on Chidswell Lane, as well as the uh, roundabout that's being, um, or will soon be constructed on our lane, um, which will ultimately connect through to this site via the Barrett David Wilson site um, on our lane. Um, in addition, we've tested 12 off-site junctions, including M62 Junction 28 and M1 Junction 40. And through the transport assessment process, we've identified that mitigation may be required at several of these junctions, including the Shawcross Junctions, um, the Leeds Road, Haybeck Lane, Sutil Lane Junction, the Dewsbury Road, Syke Road, Rain Road Junction over the boundary in Leeds, as well as potentially at M1 Junction 40 and M62 Junction 28. In relation to Shawcross, as, um, as, as has already been mentioned, it is proposed that the applicant um, provides a contribution to Kirklees to allow the delivery of that scheme um, that has been developed by the council um, that's also received some contributions from other developments in the area. In relation to the two mitigation schemes at the two motorway junctions, um, we've been in extensive discussions with both national highways as well as the two respective local highway authorities um, for a period of time, and we've identified uh, mitigation schemes for each, which have been agreed in principle, um, subject to the outcomes of um, road safety audit processes, which are coming towards their conclusion um, at this point in time. The improvement scheme at Junction 28 has been developed in collaboration with the transport consultants acting on behalf of Capital Park, and it is agreed in principle that um, whichever development, whether it's the Chidswell scheme or Capital Park, requires the delivery of that mitigation scheme first, would deliver a first phase, with the other development um, potentially then delivering a follow-on phase, which would then give you the complete scheme. Um, we're currently in discussions with National Highways regarding um, the potential implementation of a monitoring strategy which would be secured by an appropriate mechanism. Um, the purpose of that monitoring strategy, um, which would be carried out post um, planning consent um, being granted, if indeed it's, it's granted consent, that would identify the appropriate time at which mitigation may need to be delivered. Um, there are a number of factors which could change between now and, and in the future, such as levels of background traffic growth and indeed um, whether the predicted traffic generation for the development materialises in accordance with um, what's been predicted. And it's proposed that that monitoring strategy is carried out um, once certain trigger points have been reached on the site and is then repeated at regular intervals. And we're currently in negotiation with um, all four highway authorities, including National Highways, um, to iron out the sort of the key principles that would form a framework um, to then um, set out how that monitoring strategy would then um, be carried out. Um, as has also been mentioned, um, we've had discussions with West Yorkshire Combined Authority as well as Arriva regarding public transport provision uh, and it's agreed in principle that development would make a financial contribution towards public transport improvements, whether that is enhancements to existing bus services um, and or improvements to um, bus infrastructure such as bus stops. It's noted that the vast majority of the development is already within 400 metres walking distance of existing bus stops, including on Leeds Road. However, to serve the periphery of the development, particularly along the eastern side, it is anticipated that at some point buses would be brought into the development and when the Spine Road is ultimately completed, connecting Leeds Road with our lane, um, there would be the potential for buses to enter one end of the site and leave the other end. Um, and 
I think that really brings to an end um, my summary of the transport matters that have taken place to date. So I'll hand over to uh, Christian from Savills. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christian Colbert from Savills, and as has been discussed, I've been reviewing the Section 106 obligations um, at, for, for the allocation. So um, this slide just shows you the, uh, the total Section 106 obligations for Haybeck Lane and Leeds Road. So we have a total amount of obligations of £21,176,072. Um, we're pleased to, uh, pleased to say that we consider the development can provide for all the obligations that have been requested. Uh, these include the development of a new two-form entry primary school with early years provision and policy compliant affordable housing in every phase. That's something that the client is very um, keen to achieve. Also, as Steve referenced, there are some major upgrades to the junction 28 of the M62, which are required. If you look at those, uh, that obligation in total, that provides for 26% of the total obligations at 5,570,000. And the primary education provision is, is 10 million pounds, which accounts for 47%. So as you can see, those two obligations comprise the, the vast majority of the section 106 obligations in total. So moving on to Haybeck Lane itself, um, we have ring-fenced some of the Section 106 obligations for this particular site. These are the obligations that this site would, would trigger, essentially, as you can see for this site. Uh, we've got circa £697,000 worth of obligations, um, which would be required, and we have timed these um, for the individual times that they are required, but also to ensure that we've got a, a steady cash flow across the site. So the first payments are made at um, 60 units, and that would comprise 56% of the total ob obligations. And as discussed, uh, it would be policy compliant affordable housing across this phase, with all of the Section 106 obligations that are due uh, paid uh, by 120 units, um, so in advance of the, uh, the development being completed. Um, here are some of the triggers that we've put forward for Haybeck Lane. As you can see, the, uh, some of the local junctions come forward very early at circa si occupation of 60 units, um, and the rest of them are spread over the phase. Um, so overall, to help with uh, the cash flow for the scheme. Moving on to Leeds Road, so this is the uh, larger of the site, uh, larger of the two sites. Um, this provides for the vast majority of the Section 106 obligations at um, over £20 million. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure going on this site, and, and as you might be aware, the infrastructure has to go in early during the scheme. Um, but that said, we also have a lot of Section 106 obligations that are required early in the scheme. So we have tried at times to try and mitigate this and, and provide a smooth cash flow for the site to make sure that everything can be delivered. And um, we would like to say that this has been achieved. As you can see, 57% of the total obligations are paid by occupation of 343 residential homes, which is only 25% of the entire homes that is to be provided. So we really are front-loading the Section 106 obligations to ensure that the, the scheme is mitigated. Um, and again, it's policy-compliant policy affordable housing in every phase. So moving on to the triggers, I'm afraid, sorry, this slide's not showing up very well. Um, the text that is in brown, I can promise you, um, that is with regards to the Junction 28 and Junction 40 improvements. This text in brown, because we see this being a two-way a two -way trigger, so it could either be triggered by the residential units or it could be triggered by the commercial development, because the commercial development itself could incur the vehicle movements, meaning that it's required. So whichever happens first will trigger, um, trigger those obligations and it will be paid. As far as the school goes, um, as was mentioned, at circa 300 units across both sites, because there becomes a requirement um, for school places. We propose to pay one million pounds um, at that 300 unit point, so a temporary solution can be delivered. After which, we would pay a further four million pounds within that first phase of Leeds Road after which the, um, the remaining money would be paid on a per unit basis as, as school places are incurred. Alternatively, um, rather than obliging the council to develop the school and as giving, providing the money as described here, we, um, the church commissioners or the developer could actually build out the school and we would ensure that that was delivered early and in time with the, uh, 
uh, as it's required, but we'd still provide that one million pounds um, at the 300 units point. The chair will allow you to continue. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so we have been conscious that the uh, the school, as as has previously described, um, needs some flexibility, and that's what we've really tried to ensure within our numbers. And we we consider that has has been achieved, um, whilst also making sure that all the infrastructure can come forward within those early phases as required, because there is a, there is a lot of infrastructure to go in. Moving on to the employment site, as you can see, see here, most of the, well, all of the Section 106 obligations are in regards to the, uh, the Junction 28 and Junction 40 improvements, and we're saying that the triggers here would be based on 25% of occupation for the, uh, of the site. We envisage the employment site will, in reality, come forward early. There's a lot of demand for employment at the moment, so there is a good chance that the employment site could come forward before the first phase of Leeds Road, and that's why we wanted to have a, a dual trigger, um, just in case the, the employment site did trigger those, um, those obligations. That's everything from me. Thank you. Hey. Colleagues, it's over to you for questions. Moan. I don't know fully about this one, but yeah, I, it's a good news uh, to read this report and know from this uh, officer, yes, uh, under the Section 106 obligation, major road junction around the area will be improved, yeah? alongside the contribution from other developers in, 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 in the area, that's a, that's a big news. So it will be started before the housing delivery start. I'm, I'm happy they have some agreed, agre, oh, I don't know if it's agreement or agree, they agree with the, on the public transport, with the West Yorkshire Transport Committee to provide uh, a river bus will provide service to public service to the state. Uh, yeah, under, under our local plan, under the 10 year local plan, we have to achieve at least 31,000 houses by 2031. Yeah. I'm not sure under the scheme we will get the, and the housing delivery by 2031 with, they say, 15, 1,535 houses. I'm not sure about that. Well, the chart on the 30, page 39 is so. I couldn't understand fully. It's with regard to the school anyway, yeah? So he said 2045, yeah, year 2045 will be 1,535. So I'm not quite sure about this chart anyway. Yeah, can the officer explain me? Yeah. Thank you. Andrew and then Paul. Thank you, Chair. I've, I'll start off with a, a series of questions which um, um, are sort of connected, but not entirely. Um, the point was made about in relation to the school um, that um, it would um, take children not just from this site but from the surrounding area. And of course, the surrounding area includes a bit of lead. Um, so I'd just like to check what schools in, in the adjacent part of Leeds have been looked at to see whether, whether um, any, any people are likely to go to them. Um, I'd also like to know if, if planners know of any um, housing developments in the adjacent part of Leeds, which, which may, of course, have an effect on, on a school in that location, um, given parental choice and all of that. Um, or, or indeed of, uh, in Gawthorpe, in Wakefield. Um, but um, then I'm, I'd, I'd also query whether any examination has been done of Junction 41 on the M1 um, 
which, you know, on the face of it is not directly related to this site, but, but in terms of, of the routes that people would take in order to avoid congestion on the M1 or M62 um, may well be relevant. Um, and finally, I, I, I'm totally in favour of bus services being diverted into the site because this is certainly big enough to um, support um, bus services that serve that, that development. Um, I mean, we got, got, this is a classic piece of ribbon development on Leeds Road. You couldn't, you couldn't find a, a better example any, anywhere. I don't know whether it was built before the war, but that's, that's you know, one of the reasons Planning Act came into existence was to try and stop this sort of thing. Um, but um, uh, it, it would be good to have some, in, in one sense, to have houses behind that. In another sense, I, I would, in theory, be totally against this site because the agricultural land that it is taking is a reasonably good quality. Um, but it's in the plan, and there's not much I can do about it at, that, at this stage. So um, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave the questions hanging for answers at an appropriate moment. Thank you, Chair. can come in now just so there's yeah. <laughs> okay um just on councillor sockle's point about local plan housing delivery yes uh there is the targets out in the local plan that that was based on deliver or is dependent upon delivery of large residential schemes such as this one uh and the local plan runs to 2031 uh, that indicative delivery schedule set out at paragraph 8.2 of the position statement does obviously go beyond that date um, that's longer than obviously the council had in mind when it was putting together uh, its targets in the local plan that's that longer program is partly a consequence of the time it's taken to thrash out the highways issues and other issues that, that have prevented this application being brought forward for determination sooner um, that said the program that's out there at paragraph 8.2 is indicative it, it could change uh, delivery could speed up as well as slow down depends on how the market responds to perhaps the first few phases of development here there is also a buffer built into the council's housing targets to allow for some some sites to not be delivered within the local plan period as well um, Obviously, an applicant and their developer partners will build out the scheme as, as quickly as possible, but the council can't, can't force uh, applicants to build their schemes. Um, what the council can do is, is make sure that an adequate supply of, of, of housing land is, is, is available and that adequate numbers of planning permissions have been, have been approved as well. Just on the queries about primary schools, the, the comments from colleagues in education only refer to schools within Kirklees and not to schools outside the borough that's normal I will go back to education colleagues to to get a, a steer from them on how they take into account uh, parental choice and the fact that, that that parents can send their kids to uh, to schools outside the borough or parents living outside the borough can send theirs to to Kirklees schools um, as regards other developments outside Kirklees that may have an impact on education demand in Kirklees, there is the Hague Moor development in Leeds that I've mentioned in the position statements. I will, next time this comes back to committee, I will uh, try and have some information from, for you about how, if and how that development has, has collected education contributions. Obviously, that's, that's Leeds City Council's responsibility for doing that. Um, Wakefield... I'm not aware of any large residential developments nearby. Um, that might partly because be because like uh, Wakefield are currently working on their new local plan. Um, there may not be any large sites close close to uh, to Chiswell that could impact on demand uh, in this locality. Junction 41. I'll have to hand over to a, a highways colleague on that on that question. 
uh, just finally on the agricultural land that would be lost as part of this development, that, that was a high level assessment of that issue was, was carried out during the local plan preparation. Chair, with, if it's okay with you, hand over to Highways regarding Junction 21, uh, 41. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, the National Highways haven't required an assessment of uh, Junction 41. Uh, and that's on the basis that the development wouldn't have a, a significant impact to that junction. I think that's set out in the transport assessment that it would be less than uh, 60 peak hour trips at that junction. So National Highways haven't required that. Right. Um, Councillor Davis. Thanks. Um, yeah, a few areas really want to pick up. Um, firstly, uh, the issue around um, levels of traffic. Um, understand the idea of this, the monitoring system going forward and appreciate uh, that's a good idea. Part of me has some concerns that we, uh, that we could end up in some perpetual discussions, negotiations over that uh, going forward, and that would be a worry for me uh, in that regard. Um, I think the view that is quite an optimistic view, and I hope it's, I hope it's true, uh, that uh, uh, vehicle numbers possibly won't increase as, as, as envisaged at the moment. Uh, that would be good, um, though I think uh, that would be my, just something, a comment, that it would n certainly not be um, beneficial if we, if we end up in perpetual negotiations over, you know, technicalities and if it's this, that, and whatever. So it's just a, a comment, really, on that. Uh, great to see the biodiversity gain on site. That's fantastic. Um, as this, uh, the programme is certainly going forward and will hit, be hitting um, sort of legislation around heating sources, uh, my comment would be that we should do everything to encourage the developers to start as we mean to go on. And actually, it should be air source heating from the very beginning. Uh, it seems to me that would make uh, a lot of sense, particularly as there's absolutely they will have to do that at some point. I know we can't uh, enforce that, but I would really uh, hope that officers could very strongly uh, make those uh, recommendations. Um, and we've already seen some examples, haven't we? There was the Red Road development some t some a couple of meetings ago where they're actually doing that now. So, so oh, clearly that you know, that can be done uh, within profit margins as well. The other thing was just to uh, out the school, uh, and I'll let Councillor Patson talk more about that in her area. But I do, but but I do understand the, the problems here. And one thing we can't. And, and sometimes people, uh, and res citizens and residents don't understand if we do create a school and spaces that can cause more problems um, than solutions if we do it too early. But at the same time, obviously, it's got to be in there uh, where we're alleviating any pressures. I know the schools team will work uh, very well. That we've got an excellent, excellent team around, around that. Um, and, I'm, and it's good to hear the applicant saying that there's got flexibility and they would consider building the school as well as the contribution and that that may well be a pragmatic solution uh, possibly uh, even to the point that if the school was built it doesn't have to be fully occupied or fully used does it and that may be um, something which is useful uh, going forward um, so I think that's that's certainly positive the other thing with with parental choice as we all know, unfortunately, and I really do mean unfortunately, lots of parents make choices through league tables, Ofsted um, report and whatever. This school will have nothing, it'll have no history. I'm sure it will attract people from outside, but at the same time, people, uh, parents tend to be sending their children to schools with a proven record. Uh, so it, that may not be the biggest issue, but who knows? And my last, last question really is around the affordable homes. Um, I see we've got, I think it's 149 rented and 122 intermediate. Um, have we got any view at this st stage of, of, you know, these one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, or is it too early at this stage to have that? Too early. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, okay, Carol, and then go back to Victor. Victor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I actually wasn't going to mention it, education, <laughs> but I will now. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, 
Subject to um, yeah, officer comments, I would have thought, I mean, it would be great to take up um, the, the offer of building the, the, the school. Um, yes, we don't want to fill it completely right from the word go because that does put, um, well, has an impact on other schools, but uh, I presume from the figures that we're talking, it's a two-form entry. We can always make it one-form entry in the first instance and or sort of build it up year by year. Um, so there are ways, but to, to have um, a school, the whole school there, built um, right at the beginning, that, that would be um, excellent for, for the children that we're going to get, rather than any porter cabin solutions, etc., which might, uh, might uh, transpire. Um, but of course, we have actually got to find someone to run the school, because it will be a free school, which means that academies will need to bid for it. I mean, that's not an issue, um, but, um, I mean, in itself, but it will, you know, all that has to, there's timing involved in, in all of that as, as well. But that should overcome, to a certain extent, um, <coughs> Councillor Davis, your uh, um, point about there won't be an Ofsted because the MAT or the Academy chain will have some sort of reputation um, that uh, parents could go by. There will always be anywhere... Um, on a boundary, cross-boundary schools, I mean, children going to Leeds, to Wakefield, and, and vice versa. So it usually balances out. So I don't... Um, I mean, it would be good to have the information about um, Leeds and Wakefield schools when we, we do come to this final application, but um, it, it does usually balance itself out on, on the whole. Um, and my comment was going to be about footpaths. Um, and I can see a wonderful opportunity here, especially, I mean, it's been said somewhere that uh, um, there may not be so many um, traffic movements or cars in, uh, movements increased by this development because of various different, um, the, um, the new transport system coming on board, etc. But also cycleways, I, could, I can see from this map and the map of the public rights of way there, absolute op um, opportunities for um, people to, to get to work, to get to school, by cycle, by walking, um, as long as these footpaths are developed properly. I mean, if, it's a, if they're not to uh, current standards in terms of shared cycle and footway rights of way, um, then they won't be as welcoming or as well used as they, they could be. Um, so I really hope that uh, as much effort is put into designing the public rights of way here for good um, walking and cycling routes, but also if there's any opportunity um, through 106 possibly to extend those public rights of way to, because at some point they, they, the public rights of way stop just shy of um, well, they're, they're connected to con um, a, a footpath which is outside of the scheme, which is not very far. I mean, like the one at Haybeck, for instance, or, or even one of the ones going right through the industrial um, zone. That, uh, that, that, you know, if we could actually spend a bit of money on those to improve them, which I'm sure they probably need it, uh, to make sure that they are used as well for... Um, for, for, as I say, getting to work, getting to school, that would be absolutely great. So I, I, I look forward to seeing the, um, as I say, the design for those footpaths in the, the, the final application. Thanks. Victor, do you want to come in or...? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chair. Three, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the only question was about the, uh, the size of the affordable unit um, from Councillor Davis and... Um, yeah, it, it, at this stage, at outline stage, we wouldn't we wouldn't be um, going into that kind of detail. But at reserve matter stage, if outline permission is granted, yes, we would have uh, discussions with the applicant about what's appropriate, and we'd refer to uh, evidence of housing need and also the new housing mix SPD that's currently in draft form that that is likely to be adopted in some form by the time reserve matters applications are submitted, if, if outline permission is granted. Um, on the point about um, extending public rights away beyond the site, that, that may well be possible. The applicant, the church commissioners, do own a lot of land to the 
east of the application site, including land within Wakefield. They also own the two uh, ancient woodlands that I mentioned during the site visit this morning, um, although they are in um, in uh, agricultural tenancies at the moment, so some negotiation with the with the uh, farmers would would need to take place. But we can certainly dis discuss that 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 request with the applicant team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll mention some. I might, might have missed it earlier on, but one thing that I always say about big sites is I hope that the homes are going to be built to national minimum size. Um, if I've missed it, I apologise, but if not, I've just mentioned it anyway. Um, right, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few observations and thoughts on, on this, uh, which I have nearly every time that there's uh, uh, a site of this size comes to, uh, comes to planning. One is uh, the bus service uh, conundrum. Um, you know, even with a thousand plus dwellings, uh, I think we've all in the recent past had villages in our in our wards, etc., that have got a lot more than a thousand dwellings in them that have had a river cancel bus services because they're non-profitable. So depending on uh, somebody like Arriva to put a bus service in here is is a, a is a tall order so that was the thing about public service as far as buses are concerned next is on uh, point 10 to 10 point 5 on sustainability and climate change uh, waxing lyrically about um, how how this this site will be um, within the regulations as far as climate change is concerned. But I think we all know that one of the worst things that you can do for releasing carbon is digging soil over as far as the topsoil is concerned. So 35 hectares of land that we've got to chew up and then stick concrete on and then bricks and mortar, we're actually doing more damage as far as the climate than we could do with any other thing in, in the borough. So I'm not sure that we should be uh, making false statements of being able to stick to climate change guidance. Uh, the other one is the school that, that worries me slightly as far as not the building of it, but the enforcement of getting it built from the developer. Uh, one thing that I've experienced over the last few years with enforcement is that it's almost an oxymoron. Uh, is the title of the department as far as enforcing is concerned. We seem to be light on staff and, and light on fist as far as enforcing certain things. So I'd like to see a tightening up of the, of the agreement between council and the developer as far as making sure that we get what the local residents deserve as far as a school on time delivered and giving the local residents that service when they need it, not when the developer wants to build it. So that was reference to the school. And the other thing is more of a, um, a personal crusade more than anything. I suppose I should put my uh, Green Party hat on rather than my Conservative one at the moment and say that we're, we're losing another 35 hectares of land and we'll never get that back. And as far as carbon's concerned, climate change, and only having 11,000 acres of land in the borough, um, I look forward to um, sat on any panel or committee on the local plan review in the next 12 to 18 months to discuss how we can better utilise the spare land that we've got or the green land that we've got in this borough rather than building another 1,100 um, dwellings that always resemble to me a Lego city um, development rather than something that the community could really get hold of and admire. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Thank you, uh, developer team, for sharing that information. I think that's been quite a helpful exercise. 
The point around delivery, we wanted to run you through today what would be delivered when we get to a decision or ready to make a decision, which we hope will be at December, by the time we've, we've got to that place. I want you to see a section, uh, not a full section 106, you'll see the heads of terms. Those heads of terms will cover all the matters you've heard from today, and they will include triggers about timings that you can expect things to be built out by. And the financial uh, appraisals that you've been seeing today are the basis by which we can then set those appropriate triggers to tie in with when they're needed. So the highway works, that's needed early on if the impact is generated and it's costed to be done early. So you know that there is confidence that they won't, be, they won't not do it. They can afford to do it. It's in their interest to monitor, of course it is. It's in their interest to encourage a bus to come into the site to reduce the uh, amount of private vehicles or whatever. But if those things don't generate the same way, then there's a, an ability to pay for the works that are required on the local and the strategic highway network. And we'll set out those triggers and they'll be in the section 106. So they'll be legally binding and we'll have much greater enforcement positions on those matters. <coughs> same goes for the affordable housing when we get there. And when we get onto the school, the, the million pounds by 300 dwellings gives the council the flexibility to provide school placements how it sees fit within its existing school portfolio in the area. And that's a really flexible way of ensuring that for a period of time, there'll be enough school places for our existing residents and the new ones coming in from this development should, should it get be built out in our times. The other issue about the delivery of the, the brand new school the school will be built to a very comparable standard as the Brambles one, if you want an example in your mind, which is a fantastic new school. It is two-form entry. There are ways of doing it in a phased approach, as you suggest, Councillor Patterson, and all of that can be worked through. If the, de if the developer builds it, that gu guarantees the certainty of it, but the money is equivalent to that build, so the council has the flexibility. And we'll, the either-or option, works the developer probably wants to build it and actually it makes a lot of sense if they do do it but we can do it if we need to because the money is in place so i'm fairly confident that ha having run through the exercise today you can see that you're getting 1300 units 35 hectares of employment so it's about 110 20 hectares of developed land we're going to end up with and we are going to be in a place where you're getting every single policy obligation that you expect as a result of the plan and all the mitigations that are required on the local highway network and in the surrounding areas to ensure that this site can be accommodated. There are some big growth areas in, in the borough. This part of Kirklees is a particularly significant area of change and growth. So the quality agenda is high on my list. The place, what's it gonna look like? Are we gonna be proud of it? Is it going to be interesting and is it going to have a range of housing? And Victor highlighted our SPD that's out to consultation at the minute and that seeks to provide a range of housing numbers, sizes and tenures in different parts of the borough. So we welcome that. That should be in place by the time we get there. And then the final point I just want to reinforce on sustainability because it is high on the agenda. This is a sustainable site. It's been through that process in the local plan. And it's the details of the outline application that then establish the principle. But at building regs, they get changed in 2024 to require a form of um, uh, energy generation that isn't from um, fossil fuels, from boilers effectively. So this, the reality here is by the time this gets through a planning process, assuming it gets an outline, it's an assumption, it's not a guaranteed, if it gets one and then it goes to reserve matters and it goes to the marketing of the site to the private sector, the reality is the build out will be within the new building regs framework for the vast majority of development here. And then the final, final point I just want to reinforce, social value. This is a huge development opportunity for our young people, our trades people, our local enterprises, our businesses and our colleagues across the council have been meeting with the church commissioners who are very aware of their social value responsibilities to ensure that we get the best opportunities for people to learn about construction, learn about development, 
and to experience either work experience or even apprenticeships. So there's a lot being done to maximise the benefits that not just building arrives, but for people as well. So, as I say, December, that's the intention. Um, we will flesh out the issues you've identified. I thank you very much for all that feedback. Um, and we will hopefully have a sufficient amount of information for you to decide to uh, make a decision on these planning applications. And we should have a clearance from the high national highways to allow you to make a local decision. But that's being resolved now. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your time and contributions. Uh, thank you, Chair. But thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Matthias, and thank you to the applicants for coming in. Um, as a member on this committee that's been involved with this application right from its conception, it really is important that we get it right. This is why it's been going on so long. Also, as has been mentioned, you've got to look at its location to the M1, M62, Leeds, Wakefield, Bradford, etc. Um, it's vital that we get this right. And uh, I've got to say, I think today's presentation has been really, really useful. Um, it's laid a lot of trigger points out for us that we've, I'm sure that we're happy to see. Um, and I just, if it does come in December, things, fingers crossed, we might have a busy December, um, and let's see where we go when we get the, you know, full application. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Richard has spoken this morning to us on, as on the date the officer have in mind is the 14th of December, I think. We are on 14th of December, a councillor. Um, Patterson and myself are on the License and Safety Committee on the same day. This is more important than licensing. Uh, Mohan, well, Mohan, that's, that's <laughs> Mohan, can I just we, confirm? We're going off. I can just off confirm. Field. I know it's <laughs> more important. We need the housing, yeah? Right, I but can confirm that the more licensing important meeting as well. has been cancelled. There you go. Told you. The more important. Mouth, so the 14th is free. Thank you. We're seeing you to licensing, yeah. so if you're all right, Mohan, you, you can sleep safely tonight. Yeah. Right, on that note then, I thank everybody for your attendance today, and uh, we'll see you.